and uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for such extraordinary program and stellar speakers. Uh, thanks very much to all the experts for accepting the invitation to come to London, and thanks also to our distinguished audience for joining us today and sharing our anticipation. We are about to enjoy two very intense days of timely updates and discussion on the most relevant aspects of multiple sclerosis, provided by some of the most knowledgeable people in this field. And, uh, and I am delighted to introduce now the speaker who is going to present the Lancet Neurology Lecture on the Epidemiology of MS in Children, Emmanuel Bovant. Emmanuel Bovant is Professor of Clinical Neurology and Pediatrics at UCSF in San Francisco, where she also directs their pediatric MS clinic. Bovan's approach to clinical neurology is quite unusual. And I believe it is so special because she combines two very strong traditions. That of the French School of Neurology, based on outstanding clinical skills, finest clinical descriptions, with the tradition of the American School and a rigorous approach to experimental neurology and scientific evidence. Professor Bovan unifies the best aspects of these two traditions. Bovant went to medical school and did her residence in neurology in France, but she did her training in neuroimmunology in the States. And for several years, she went back and forth across the ocean and eventually returned to her native France to head a clinical research center at the Salpetriere Hospital in Paris. But perhaps moved by the warmer temperatures of California, she decided to go back to the States uh, in 2001, where she has been a faculty member of UCSF ever since. Professor Bobant is not only an experienced physician and an accomplished investigator, she's also a fantastic mentor for young phys physicians, sorry, a task for which she has received several awards. She is also a funding member of the network of international women in MS. I would like to mention today that every year, the Lancet journals choose a priority area for which urgent attention from institutions and policy makers we believe is needed. In 2020, our campaign is on child and adolescence health. It is therefore a great honor for me to start our campaign in support of children with neurological disorders with this landmark lecture presented by such an outstanding neurologist. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the nice uh, introduction. So the, uh, I'll give you a tip uh, about my, uh, the reason for all my back and forth. Uh, not that I'm unstable. At some point, Dr. Confabre told me, I thought you were a little unstable, Emmanuel. You know, you go back and forth, and I was like, no, you know, my husband is born and raised in San Francisco, and uh, you can't uproot these people. You know, they have to stay in their environment, so I keep him happy. So uh, the uh, lecture today uh, is entitled Epidemiology of Pediatric MS. I will, uh, I have my disclosures here, uh, and there's really uh, nothing uh, that is going to uh, change uh, or color what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I want to, as uh, you heard Elena mention, uh, uh, International Women in MS, I have the little logo. Uh, that's one of my disclosures, and uh, that's uh, probably one of the reasons I was invited uh, to co-chair because I'm bringing all that uh, side of uh, uh, neurology in MS, uh, and I, I think that uh, it's been an exciting uh, thing to develop. My other uh, disclosure is that I am not a pediatric neurologist by training. I'm an adult neurologist by training, so I'm bringing up, uh, you know, looking at MS from the adult ex experience and then 
looking at children with the disease uh, from that, that angle. So I'm going to talk about incidence and prevalence of uh, pediatric MS. I'll talk briefly about the age of onset and the sex ratio, and you'll hear later uh, with Dr. Ye actually uh, a description of uh, the, the clinical presentation uh, in young patients. I'll briefly talk about racial and uh, ethnic characteristics, but then I will focus on some of the genetic understanding and the environmental risk factors that have been uh, studied in uh, pediatric MS. So the first thing is that uh, pediatric MS is uh, a rare disease. Uh, it's to some extent considered to be an orphan disease, and it's been really difficult to have a good understanding of what are the numbers. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that, as an adult neurologist, you don't realize until you take care of these kids is that you see them as children and then they age out, and so that's why often for the long term you actually lose some of uh, the information about the, the outcome in, in these uh, patients. Uh, there's a couple of studies that have suggested that the incidence of pediatric MS is in the ballpark of 0.5 to 1 uh, child per year uh, per 100,000. Uh, so this is rare, uh, but that matches about the, uh, the incidence of uh, ADEM, for example, and that's higher than the incidence of uh, pediatric uh, NMO. So because it's a rare disease, it's uh, very often underdiagnosed, especially in the world of pediatricians. Uh, I think that the efforts of different MS societies over the past 10 years or 15 years have been really helpful to put pediatric MS on the map. Uh, and the goal was to put the disease on the map uh, in that age range to help actually treatment, uh, diagnosis, and appropriate treatment in these uh, children. So we think in a country like the US, there's five to 10,000 pediatric MS uh, cases, but what you should know is that uh, between five and 10% of all MS patients have an onset before the age of 18. Uh, so not anything really uh, that uncommon. We have, so there's uh, something that has happened in the world is that there's been really a momentum that has been created to uh, help uh, uh, different networks of physicians and scientists to really uh, talk to each other to try to help uh, advance uh, the understanding of pediatric MS. And one of the network is in the US. Uh, we have launched um, over 10, well, almost 10 years ago, a, a big study to look at environmental and genetic risk factors in pediatric MS. And one of the outcome of this study was to look at familial autoimmunity. So uh, this is actually uh, work that is uh, currently under review and looking at the rate of different autoimmune disease in uh, pediatric MS. And you can see on this slide that there's actually a fair amount of uh, autoimmune disease in first degree, but uh, also second degree relatives. Uh, what's very interesting is that there might be actually uh, a differential in how frequent these autoimmune diseases are depending uh, on the maternal or the paternal side, uh, suggesting that maybe there's genetic imprinting uh, in, uh, in this. I will switch to uh, the age of onset and the sex ratio, and uh, this slide is actually taken from also data from the Pediatric MS uh, Network in the US, looking at a cohort of patients for who uh, data has been, have been uh, prospectively entered in a uh, database. And you can see here that this, uh, this was uh, taken from a group of over 600 pediatric MS uh, patients seen uh, at 12 different uh, universities. And you can uh, see on this slide that the vast majority of the patients that have been seen by the group are actually teenagers. But you can see that 20, 25% of the patients are actually under the age of uh, 11 or so. 
Another thing that's very interesting on that slide is uh, that you can see that the sex ratio, so in the lavender are the males and in uh, red are the females, you can see that the sex ratio is pretty much uh, one to one before the age of puberty and you can see that around age of puberty you can start seeing actually the sex ratio that's changing that is something that uh, will remain uh, in adulthood. Another thing that is, uh, you know, looking at pediatric MS, you can study the effect of uh, hormonal status. Uh, it's actually difficult to do, uh, you know, in detail because puberty is not something that occurs overnight. This is a process that occurs over several years. Uh, but trying to understand whether puberty had an effect on MS uh, onset, uh, the network also looked at uh, the, uh, the frequency of MS uh, onset compared to age of uh, menarche. So this was done uh, in uh, all the girls who were in uh, the registry of the pediatric MS network. And you can see that the peak onset uh, of uh, pediatric MS is actually two to two and a half years after uh, menarche. So there's similar work that uh, is, uh, uh, we're trying to do in uh, boys, but this is uh, more difficult in terms of having a biological landmark that <coughs> defines uh, better where you can uh, uh, put the, the, the clock of, uh, uh, or specific timing of the, uh, the puberty. When we uh, published a few years ago, that was a smaller study, uh, the effect of puberty on the course of MS, because you could imagine that there might be an increase or a decrease in the risk of uh, relapses around the time of puberty. We had the impression that there might be a little uh, peak of MS relapses around perimenarchy. Uh, there's a bigger study than now uh, that is on its way, and we can see that there's actually an increase progressively of uh, the uh, hazard of having a relapse based on uh, the age of the patient. So before menarche, you can see that the, the risk of relapse is lower, then becomes higher, and uh, the, the reference was post menarche. All this is in the context of uh, in young patients, it may be harder to actually account all the relapses uh, just because they don't verbalize as well uh, the, the different symptoms they may have. I would think uh, Dr. Ye is going to talk uh, a little bit about that, but we know that age may actually uh, change the characteristics of the disease, including on the MRI. And I will switch now uh, more extensively to the risk factors uh, for pediatric MS. So one of the reasons I got uh, interested in studying uh, the risk factors of MS in pediatric MS uh, was uh, that you have really a unique window to look more closely uh, to what happens during uh, childhood and during the period of, uh, of exposure to different environmental uh, risk factors. I also thought that pediatric MS patients have the onset of their disease 20 to 30 years earlier than the average age of adult <coughs> MS patients, and they might be actually a higher uh, load of genetic risk factors or a higher environmental uh, load. Uh, and as such, it may be easier to detect some of these risk factors that are actually pretty elusive when you try to study them in adults. So on this slide here, I just represent uh, in a simplistic manner what we know about the risk factors for MS in, uh, in adults at least. So there's environmental risk factors. A few have been consistently reported uh, to occur in uh, in uh, in association with increased risk of MS. Then there's uh, the genes, uh, and we know that there's more than 200 genetic variants now that have been identified uh, as adult MS risk factors. And then there's uh, epigenetic changes, and all these uh, are working together to uh, increase the risk of uh, the disease. We, um, we know that when we study environmental risk factors in adults uh, who have had exposure to these risk factors 20, 30 years ago, it's actually very difficult to do. And uh, there's an increased 
uh, risk to actually detect risk or exposures uh, that are actually irrelevant to the disease. And that uh, same thing happens if you look at epigenetics. You may actually see changes in the signals you're studying, but they have nothing to do with the disease. It's just that you know, as you age, you have had more exposures to environmental risk factors and more chances to have uh, alteration, epigenetic alterations. So uh, the uh, additional things that we still don't know for MS, we know that exposures to risk factors probably occur uh, during childhood, but it's the critical time of exposure is unknown. Uh, and very often there's been a strong focus on similar risk factors, one of them being, for example, uh, past BV infection or uh, cigarette smoking. And uh, lots of these risk factors that have been uh, reported for MS are actually uh, risk factors for which causality is not demonstrated. And, and we have to keep that in mind when we uh, look at the epidemiology of the disease. I'll briefly describe some of the racial and ethnic characteristics of pediatric MS, at least in North America, uh, and then I'll switch to genetic and environmental risk factors. So this is a map here that shows you genetic ancestry, uh, and these here are genetic ancestry of pure populations, uh, uh, either European or Asian, uh, or from different origins. And here is the map of the genetic ancestry of our pediatric MS patients. So you can see that there is a huge diversity uh, in our patients. Uh, and uh, it really challenges the notion that MS is a disease of, uh, uh, of individuals with uh, mostly uh, European ancestry. In a study that was done uh, in, uh, within the Kaiser system, there was actually uh, evidence that there was an increased risk of uh, MS in uh, black children, but uh, also in uh, Asian children compared to uh, white and Hispanic children. Uh, that was later uh, reproduced uh, at least for uh, African American in adults. Uh, and that actually challenged even further the notion that MS was uh, uh, purely a disease of uh, white people. Ancestry, though, uh, may not be associated with a different rate of relapses. So this is work that was done with uh, the Pediatric MS Network, looking at whether ancestry uh, change the, the rate of uh, relapses, and we could not find uh, any uh, association. And uh, I will segue into genetic risk factors briefly, uh, because that's, uh, that's a place where we're still trying to do work, because you typically need large cohorts of patients to be able to do this work. And uh, as you heard me say, uh, pediatric MS is uh, overall rare. So to collect enough uh, DNA and clinical information uh, takes actually a lot of uh, collaborative work and uh, time. So one thing that had been published by Alexei Boyko uh, in the early 2000s was that DRB1, which is uh, the strongest risk factor for adult MS, uh, was also reporting to be associated with pediatric MS. Uh, the, uh, in the uh, North American effort, we can see that uh, the uh, odds of having pediatric MS is almost multiplied by three if uh, individuals carry uh, DRB1. So this, um, this was done only in white kids uh, because when you start studying uh, the genetic uh, makeup of MS, it becomes really uh, much more complex if you have uh, a group of uh, individuals from different ancestries. But this is work that is currently uh, being done uh, looking at different populations. The additional work that we were able to do, although overall the number of uh, patients was reasonably small, but that was uh, work that was done in some instances in collaboration with Sweden uh, because they also had a fair amount of samples from uh, pediatric onset patients. Uh, 
was that here we were able to uh, show that some of the adult MS uh, genetic variants were also associated with MS in children. Uh, we were able to confirm that out of, when we did the, the, the work, there was only uh, 110 MS risk variants that had been published for adult MS, and we showed that a third of the genes reporting to be associated with adult MS were also <coughs> associated with pediatric MS. And that was very important to do, so we could not, we were not powered to actually confirm the role of the other genes, but uh, this, you know, when we get bigger sample sizes, we'll be able to do. But that was very important to show that pediatric MS actually uh, was, uh, had a lot of similarities with adult MS in terms of the genetic background and also to some extent the environmental uh, uh, risk factors because it confirms it's overall biologically a disease that has a lot of similarities uh, regardless of the age group, uh, and that confirms also that you do uh, have the ability of studying some of these risk factors in the younger ones uh, to inform about uh, the adult disease. We start to look also at how genes may affect the risk of relapses in these patients, and this is work that we've done in collaboration with uh, Australia with the University of Tasmania uh, and we were able uh, to have actually to identify two uh, genetic variants that are associated with an increased risk of relapses and uh, one of the things I did not mention is that pediatric MS patients tend to have more relapses than uh, adult patients and that's how although you have a small cohort of patients, you actually have more power to look at uh, the effect of genes or environmental risk factors on uh, the risk of relapse. So this was uh, done here with uh, HI1, uh, similar work. And so the interesting uh, part of the work here was actually that collaborating with our um, Australian colleagues, they had a cohort of patients that were adult MS patients, and we had the pediatric patients, and we showed that we had exactly the same findings in both age groups. Uh, we did the, the similar kind of work here with uh, another, uh, another genetic variant. So I want to focus now on uh, some of the environmental exposures, and uh, I will start with pre- and perinatal exposures because there is a notion that the, the exposures uh, may start in childhood, but it's possible that some of these exposures may actually start during pregnancy. And there's very few studies that have uh, been able to look at that, but when you work with pediatric MS patients, you can ask questions to the parents about what happened during the pregnancy, whereas when you work with patients who are in their 40s or 50s, uh, you don't have uh, as good of a, a set of information. So again, uh, you, you, know, you hear me focus on lots of the studies that have uh, been done in the context of the pediatric MS network because this is really uh, one of the largest uh, data sets that was acquired with environmental risk factors information. And in that study, we were able to show that um, having a maternal illness during pregnancy uh, doubled uh, the risk of uh, of of you know, children to have uh, pediatric MS onset. And C-section actually, on the contrary, was associated with a protective effect. So all these other risk factors here were not associated with the risk of pediatric MS, but something that was not in the primary analysis that was uh, kind of um, uh, relevant to the risk of pediatric MS was exposure, having one parent exposed to an agricultural uh, or gardening-related occupation. Uh, and I'll come back to that afterwards regarding uh, the use of pesticides. So how uh, exposure during pregnancy could actually translate into a disease that occurs uh, 10, 15 years later, it's really unknown. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, there's brain activation syndrome that could be promoted by exposure during uh, pregnancy, endocrine interaction, but also the gut microbiota and uh, the first contact with uh, bacteria in one's life is uh, at birth. I will uh, 
go now about diet and microbiome, and I kept them uh, intermingled because I think it's really uh, hard to talk uh, of one without uh, acknowledging the other one. We started to look at diet and uh, the risk of pediatric MS in association with diet, and we uh, that was actually work uh, done uh, by Julia Pakpour, who is uh, based uh, in the UK and uh, came to work with us at UCSF for a little while. And we did not find that any of the big food categories were associated with the risk of pediatric MS. But uh, there was uh, a lower than, uh, a lower, recommend, uh, lower intake of iron uh, in the group uh, with pediatric MS compared to the control group. Unclear how we can reconcile that, but at least now we can tell parents uh, that feel very guilty to have a kid uh, that develops uh, pediatric MS that they didn't do anything wrong about the diet that their kid was exposed to because often we hear a lot of concerns about that. More interestingly about diet, uh, we were able to uh, look at how the diet may actually relate to the risk of relapse in this, uh, in this uh, uh, cohort. And we had more than 200 patients in that group and we were able to show that for each 10% increase in the energy uh, intake that was from fat, there was actually a 53% higher risk to have relapses in that group. And that was independent from the effect we saw with the intake of vegetables. So, for each additional cup of vegetables, the patients actually had a 42% decrease in their risk of relapse. These were uh, adjusted analysis. And uh, when we tried to zoom in on the uh, association with fat, we actually were able to show that all the uh, risk of relapse was mostly uh, attached to uh, increased use of saturated fat. Uh, so this is something that, again, we're trying to uh, dwell in more in detail. Uh, and for example, here you can see that you can start doing metabolomic uh, work. And uh, the point of this slide here is just to show that in the uh, pediatric MS cases in red and uh, the other ones, uh, are, the controls are in uh, green, there's actually, they have less uh, amino acid uh, concentration, but more lipids compared to the, the control group. And uh, when you start looking at metabolomics, uh, you can focus on specific pathways. One of the pathways we focused on is the tryptophan pathway because different uh, metabolites of tryptophan actually can uh, trigger AHR, which is a receptor on uh, different CNS cells, uh, astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. And uh, beautiful work from Francisco Quintana showed actually that <laughs> there's a regulation of the inflammation within the brain that can be uh, mediated through AHR. So this is a complicated slide here, and that's to uh, show you first that even if you focus on one pathway, it can be challenging, but it's also showing you uh, the, the complexity of uh, the association. So when we looked at tryptophan, uh, we saw that tryptophan actually uh, was very strongly associated with the risk of uh, pediatric MS. And so for each one microgram uh, increase uh, in tryptophan, there was uh, an increase, uh, the, sorry, there was a decrease of uh, 20 to 32 percent in the risk of pediatric MS, so a very strong association. Uh, Tryptophan was not associated with the risk of relapse, but one of its metabolites, kinurinine, was actually very strongly associated with the, the risk of relapse. Uh, you can also look at some of the metabolites of tryptophan that are generating through the gut microbiome. Uh, and indolactate, for example, was associated with the risk of pediatric MS. Uh, but it's indole propionate that was associated with uh, the, uh, the progression of disability. So uh, a very complex picture uh, that uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to confirm in the future. So a few words about the uh, gut microbiome. So that's a fascinating part of our uh, body uh, that includes uh, 10 times more uh, cells than our uh, own on uh, human cells. Uh, 
And when we started to look at pediatric uh, microbiome, we also had in mind, well, if you look at the microbiome in children, it will be less uh, uh, polluted, if you will, by all sorts of exposures that have occurred uh, over the decades. And this slide here is just showing uh, we have, we're in the middle of repeating analysis uh, of work we had done uh, a few years ago on the smaller data set. And what we show is that there's no big differences in the diversity in the alpha and beta diversity of the gut microbiome in pediatric MS compared to uh, controls, but when you start looking at the uh, pathobiont themselves, you can see here, so this is a volcano plot showing uh, here that uh, some of the bacteria that are found in the gut are actually increased in controls compared to pediatric MS patients, and some others are actually increased uh, in pediatric MS compared to controls, and you can see that this is uh, log to fold change. So there's really some of these pathobionts are, you know, massively overexpressed uh, or underexpressed in uh, depending on the the, the group. Uh, this is important to keep in mind because uh, very often people have tried to say microbiome, actually there's really one main category of bacteria that uh, have an influence of the disease, but it is uh, much more complex. In, you have to keep in mind also that whether your pediatric MS patients are treated with disease-modifying therapy or not, uh, they're actually going to show uh, if they are treated uh, some increase in some uh, bacterian categories, whereas uh, the untreated uh, have a very different microbiome. We have started to look at the association of the microbiome with the risk of relapse, and uh, this is preliminary work. So uh, two categories uh, seem to be associated with protection from uh, relapses in uh, pediatric MS patients, and uh, that is here just showing overall the gut-brain interaction uh, that starts with the diet, uh, that uh, uh, educates immune cells, but also can have a different metabolite that stimulate different receptors that are uh, in the brain. I'll quickly go through vitamin D uh, because you probably have heard a lot about vitamin D. I will say that the first time that uh, the association between vitamin D levels and the risk of relapse was demonstrated was actually in pediatric MS uh, and confirmed later uh, in adult MS. However, this is still something that shows an association, but not necessarily causality. So working on trying to advance our understanding of causality, we have uh, worked with a group of uh, Lisa Brasilos at UC Berkeley, but also a group in Sweden that had uh, genetic data on uh, pediatric onset MS uh, patients. And what we were able to show here, so we derived a genetic risk score that uh, included different genetic variants that uh, are known to be associated with a level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D in the blood. And doing that, we showed that for, uh, there was actually uh, a very strong association between having uh, some of these genetic variants and uh, the risk uh, to develop pediatric MS. So that's showing a little bit that's a baby step towards showing causality of vitamin D and MS. Vitamin D may also be associated with the risk of relapse if you take the genetic risk score. Same thing, there's an increase in the, the risk of relapse if you carry some of these variants. Again, showing that uh, the association with vitamin D may be uh, more than uh, just an indirect association. Vitamin D uh, can uh, induce all sorts of uh, proteins and uh, has a pretty extensive uh, Im pleiotropic immune effect. Uh, I will, I think for the sake of time, I will uh, just briefly mention that we've looked at obesity uh, in pediatric MS. We've looked at childhood infections. Uh, for obesity, this is something that uh, has been actually showing uh, an association for obesity itself and the risk of pediatric MS as shown in adults, but we've also uh, showed that 
genetic variants that are associated with obesity are actually associated uh, with pediatric MS risk. And that was, again, uh, 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 work we've done in uh, collaboration with Sweden. Lots of reason to uh, think uh, how obesity uh, can affect different uh, immune pathways, uh, and I will not uh, uh, talk too much about that. You've heard me early on say that EBV was strongly associated with pediatric MS. Uh, I think that more exciting is actually to look at interaction between Epstein-Barr virus and uh, uh, genetic uh, groups. And here, this table shows that there are very strong interaction between being DRB1, 1501, and uh, uh, being positive for EBV. Same thing with HSV. There's actually a pretty strong interaction between HSV and uh, DRB1. And I think that having uh, this uh, interaction actually is arguing even more strongly for a direct role of these viruses uh, in the uh, onset of MS. I'll just uh, finish here by saying that there's been different studies that have showed how toxics from pesticides used in the household, but also air quality can be associated with the, the risk of pediatric MS. Uh, and more work needs to be done to, uh, to confirm that and understand exactly in these uh, toxic, uh, what, what are the, uh, the chemicals that are associated with MS. So I'll just close on uh, a slide that uh, we prepared for a review we uh, published recently about the different uh, markers that I mentioned. So it's probably many different environmental markers mm -hmm. that may contribute to, uh, to MS onset. You've heard that there's more than 200 genes that are associated with MS. It's possible that in the environment the same thing happens. There could be 20, 30 different environmental risk factors that each contribute a small part to the risk of MS. And uh, these different uh, environmental risk factors have different, uh, uh, they, they uh, have different effects on uh, various uh, metabolic or uh, uh, biological pathways. So I'll conclude that pediatric MS offers really unique opportunities to study risk factors for the disease. And I will thank all the uh, people who have contributed uh, to this work. It takes a village uh, to raise a kid. Thank you for your attention.